the topic is a Amalek. That's our topic. Because the, this, what we're doing, and I've been doing it now for close to 10 years, is we're learning the sikhs of the Rebbe based on the stories of the Chumash. We're going through the, the stories of the Chumash. That's what we're doing. So, the very first two weeks of this school year, we finished off the well, Be'eda Shel Miriam, the well of Miriam. Then we spent five weeks, I think, or six weeks doing the last third of Haidu Kel Nakamas. And now we're back to the story of Amalek. The story of Amalek is a simple story, but it's a very, it's a very important, it's a very faithful story. I guess that's the right word. You didn't come out of Mitzrayim. And we all know how much the Jewish people have been through, right, to get to that point. That they're ready to leave Mitzrayim. They come out of Mitzrayim. There's a lot of great highs and great lows, right? If, 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 if you think about the story, on the one hand, the Jewish people were totally unprepared. We were totally not ready for Yitzhak Mitzrayim. That's part of the story. We were slaves for 86 years. I mean, you know, depending on how you do it, for 400 years, for 210, for 116, for 86, all of these numbers have meaning. But for 86 years, which is four generations, we were the worst kind of slavery imaginable. And then overnight, we were freed. And understand that being free is not as simple as not having a master. Being free is taking responsibility for self. That's the hard part of the Exodus story. The hard part of the Exodus story is not that Egypt was put aside, but the Jews were given freedom. And freedom is a scary thing. Freedom is a very scary thing. And the whole story of the Chumash, really the whole story of the Chumash, from the time the Jewish people leave Egypt almost till the end of the 40 years, is watching the Jewish people having a very, very difficult time embracing the responsibility they've been given. It's not easy. And of course, there's many miracles, right? Many, many miracles. The miracles help. The miracles help. When a miracle happens, you say, wow. But miracles pass. You know, a miracle comes and a miracle goes. And when the miracle passes, you very quickly forget. Very quickly forget. The inspiration from the miracle becomes rather quickly undone because people don't become different people because miracles happen. People become different people because they learn lessons, because they grow, because they work. So the miracles help. They're, they're, incre they're exciting. When a miracle happens, we're all uplifted. We're all in a holier state. But then the miracle passes. And then there's work that needs to be done. And the Jewish people are doing their best. The world around the Jewish people, the Goyim, the nations of the world that lived in proximity to Mitzrayim, are overwhelmed, right? Egypt was the dominant power in the region, perhaps in the world. I, I had once in my house many, many years ago, a woman who was a historian, and she mentioned to me something, which I later found. I bought a book that the, the word in whatever ancient language it is, I don't know if it's called ancient Ivri or it's Egyptian, for the Jewish people is El Kabiru, El Kabiru. El Kabiru, El Kabiru means Ivri in some ancient language, Hebrew. El Kabiru is Hebrew. You can almost sound, hear the similarity. El Kabiru is Ivri, right? So what, what, there is a documentation. A docu this, in other words, a lot of the question that people have is there's not a lot of archaeology to support the Jewish people leaving Egypt, the splitting of the sea, they can't find evidence of Harsinai, on and on and on and on and on. But this is well documented. They found 300 tablets, 300 letters sent from the states of Canaan to Mitzrayim, to ancient Egypt, saying the El Kabiru is in the desert, they're going to attack us, help us. And in these tablets, the spirit is, you are the powerful nation, you are the protector of the entire region. If we, if you can't help us, nobody can. They're begging Egypt to help them, and Egypt doesn't. Egypt doesn't. Pardon me. Well, they were not wiped out to a man, woman, and child. The empire was crushed. But this woman, who's not a religious woman, was saying that this is a piece of archaeology that nobody can deny that the most powerful nation in the region was begged to, to defend the, their neighbors to the north against El Kabiru, the Ivrim, and they refused. They didn't want. 
Now, why would they refuse? They don't have any audience. Because they've been pummeled by the same El Kabiru. Meaning to say there's historical evidence, not for Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, but there's historical evidence of Yidin going into Israel and that the world around them is afraid of them. The ancient world was intimidated by the presence of this tribe, of this group of people. And you know, in the Chumash, in Oz Yashish, Shomu Amim Yirgozun, the nations here, and they're filled with anger and fear. The Philistines are filled with fear. Um, and you know, the, there's several psukim in the Oz Yashin. Oz Nivalu Alufi Eretz, Ele Moe, Bechazem Erod, Momego Kel Mishchez Kinon. The different nations all are described in the Oz Yashin as being overwhelmed by fear of the Jewish people. And of course, especially Mishpachis Kenan, because they knew that uh, just, the Jews are heading to them and they were going to have to deal with them sooner or later. So there was an awe about the Jewish people. So understand the duality. On the one hand, because of all the miracles and because of the rapid success of the Jewish people, I mean, it's not the rapid, the Jewish didn't do anything. Hashem did everything. They were just the beneficiaries of that because whatever reason, they were descendants of Aram Yitzhak and Yankiv and they went through the Golos, etc. They ate matzah, they made a Korban Pesach, they made a bris, they believed in God, they trusted him. But on the other hand, they're so unconditioned, they're really, this is happening far too fast. You don't rehabilitate a person who's been in slavery for four or five generations in three weeks, it just doesn't happen. So the arrival of a Molech on the scene is incredibly significant. A Molech attacks the Jews. Now, geographically, in other words, in terms of land, where did Amalek live? It appears that they lived in the very, very south of Eretz Yisrael. They lived somewhere between the end of Israel and the beginning of Egypt. If you could see a map, they're near the coast of the Mediterranean. They're west, in other words, near where the Midbar is, near where the Jewish people were. Amalek attacked the Jewish people, and they got pummeled. They got defeated. They were crushed. And the way Rashi tells the story, Amalek knew they would be defeated. Amalek was prepared to pay a price in lives. They would lose their own soldiers. And Rashi says on the Apostolic, the Jewish people killed just the best warriors. The Nebuch they sent home. They killed the, the, the prominent members of the army. They were able to identify who were the best soldiers and those were the ones they killed. And Amalek was prepared for all of that. Why? Because Amalek stole the mystique the respect that there was to the Jewish people at that time and at that place, which was awesome. As described in the Az Yashir, right? In the few Sukkim before, Amalek made a dent in it. They made the other nations of the world say, eh, we can attack them too. Okay, Amalek attacked, Amalek got crushed. We'll come after them, they'll be weaker. We'll attack them again and maybe we'll be able to defeat them. And Rashi brings a medrash, or one of those well-known, I heard that medrash as a child, and I love that medrash. It's about a man who comes into a community and he hears that there's an abat sachas, there's a mikveh that's very, very, very hot. And people are afraid to go into it because if you go into it, you're going to get burnt. So this guy says, I'm not afraid. He jumps into this here. Mikveh gets burnt from head to toe. <laughs> but people go in after him because he cools it off. Now, whether you explain this physiologically or psychologically, the fact that somebody comes along and so recklessly disposes of himself as a statement of don't be afraid takes away some of the awe and the fear. And this creates an eternal rivalry, right? The struggle the Jewish people have with Amalek is considered immortal. It's forever. It's a very strange thing. It's a very, very strange thing that our Torah and our God, that he's everybody's God, who's represented, who is chesed, says Amalek has to be wiped out. Amalek has to be destroyed. Killed out to a last man, to a man, woman, and a child. And there's two psukim. One pasuk says, mochay timche, double, you should erase. The other pasuk says, mochay emche, again, double lashon, I will erase. But there's more. There is zochet asher Amalek. It's not enough that you didn't have a mitzvah to erase Amalek. You have to remember, you have to always remember that there's a nation of Amalek that has to be wiped out. It's very, very unusual. It doesn't make any sense. 
It's not consistent with the spirit of Taito, which is a spirit of kindness, which is a spirit of truth. That is a nation of the world that as long as they exist, the Jews have a mitzvah to remember who they are and to find the opportunity to wipe them out. It's a strange thing. It's a really, really funny concept. The Tagim Minister Menadil says at the end of the parasha, Mamish, the Mashiach comes to erase Amalek. Now, from a halachic point of view, from a legal perspective, the presumption is that Amalek is gone. There's no more Amalek. Why? Because there was a king called Sancherev. He was the king of Ashur, of Assyria, which had, for a short period of time dominated the world. And he had an interesting tactic of dealing with world domination. If you want to be a king over the whole world, which is a pretty sick idea. <laughs> it's a pretty sick idea, yeah? Um, the last person to attempt it was Hitler. The person before that was uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. There's certain madmen who want to dominate the world. There's one person who actually succeeded at it. Really did. Alexander the Great, that's how the Macedonian conquered the world, the known world. But if you have aspirations of world domination, how do you do it? How do you control the whole world? I mean, even today. But in those days, communication was, was what? On horseback. How are you going to control the whole world? So there was a lot of politics involved in controlling the world. What Alexander Macedonia did was every nation that he conquered, he adopted their customs. He had a mishagas. He would come into a nation. He would take some of their customs, make them his own, and he'd befriend them. I mean, he was a he was a very ruthless man. You know, what he did was he showed his enemies that if they resist him, he'll kill them to a man, woman, and a child. If they won't resist him, he'll let them all live. Won't touch him. He becomes the boss. They can live happily and they can retain their traditions. He would adopt their customs. A very interesting political tactic. It was successful. It worked. Alex Ashur had a different tactic. The tactic was they moved everybody around. They didn't kill people. They moved them. If you lived in Etisrael, they moved you to Chabar. To, you lived in Aram. There was a nation called Kut. They moved to Israel. By moving people around, he took away their association with their homeland. And he made them feel a little bit displaced, foreigners. So the, what the, the, the loyalty to their self-identity was taken from them. So he was able to create a new one. And that's what Sanchev did. He, he conquered all the nations of the ancient world and he moved them around. And the Chazal hold that the few nations that have special laws, like you're not allowed to marry Moyev and Amin forever. You're not allowed to marry Egypt on three generations. Um, and the uh, mitzvah of erasing Amalek, there's a presumption that all these nations became assimilated, mixed up. We no longer know who is who. In other words, the original, the purebred nations of the ancient world, according to Halacha, have been entangled. Uh, we don't know, know where they are. In fact, there's even a question why we count erasing of Amalek as one of the 613 mitzvahs. It's no longer practical. And there's an explanation for it in the Rambam. But the bottom line is practically the erasing of Amalek is no longer. Now, is it possible that Mashiach comes will identify Amalek and have to kill them? That, that possibility exists. And Jewish law is Jewish law. As unpleasant a mitzvah as this is, it's one of the things mitzvahs you have to erase Amalek. But let's be nice to ourselves. Okay, let's assume that there's no more Amalek. And after Mashiach comes, there's not going to be an identifiable people called Amalek that we need to wipe out. But just the principle, why would Hashem identify a group of people and say, you have a mortal enemy. This enemy is your enemy forever. Remember, never forget. And every opportunity you get, you have to wipe them out. Why? So the, the answer, of course, is from a historic perspective, because Amalek attacked us when we were most vulnerable. Amalek attacked us when he, the effect of that attack was to take away the mystique that the Jewish people had achieved vis-a-vis -vis the whole world. And they did it not to win. Amalek stood to gain nothing. Amalek knew they were going to lose. They did it simply to destroy our mystique. They did it simply to undermine the respect and the honor that was for the Jewish people. And um, this is an unforgivable sin, right? That's how we learned the story. That's the pshat. But Hasidus exposes the neshama of this, you understand? 
Chassidus explains to you what Amalek means. And by explaining to you what Amalek means, you have a much better and a clearer understanding of, of why it is that Amalek needs to be wiped out, okay? And that's what this Maimed is. It's a short little Maimed. The whole Maimed is four pages. It's not a long Maimed. And um, what the Maimed does is it gives us the mysticism behind Amalek. What's the Neshama? What's the spiritual Amalek? That, that is so severe, that is so terrible, that is so bad, that the only thing you can do is wipe them out. Okay, that's the spirit of this Bible. And again, I gave you two classes last week, and I'm, I'm really repeating what I said last week because I was, I, was, I was really sick. I should not have come to school. I don't even remember what I said. I you don't remember what I said. I, I put on the tapes. I listened intermittently to different pieces, but it's really, I was... I can't remember the last time I was so physically debilitated that I could not teach. I couldn't teach. I couldn't teach. I couldn't present anything substantive. You know, you were nice enough to sit and listen to me, but I was half here. So we're going to basically do it over. I'm going to reteach it to you. Okay. And I'm going to start from this. There's a pasuk, which in Chabad Hasidis is a very important pasuk. There's innumerable my modern based on this pasuk, uh, particularly Purim. My modem, it's it's a posture in Pachas Bullock. It's a posture in Pachas Bullock, where of course you have the story of Bilam, right? You're Bilam, right? Bilam was a Russia Marusha. Bilam was considered one of the worst of the Shaim who ever lived. The Mishnah in Pikiyavis describes Bilam as being the Zelo Umazev of Ramavino. Whatever good of Ramavino had, and of Ramavino is the father of our nation, Bilam was the equal and opposite of that. The Mishnah describes Bilam as being a really self-serving, megalomaniacal, evil man, Bilaam. And Bilaam is recruited to curse the Jews. And as it turns out, the nicest things anybody ever said about the Jewish people was said by this big rush of Bilaam. Hashem puts words in his mouth, as Rashi describes it, like a, uh, like a farmer puts a, a muzzle on an animal and forces him to do what he says, Shuvel, Balak, Bakois, and David, and Bilam speaks the greatest prophecies ever. And amongst the things that he speaks about, and this is a futuristic prophecy, Bilam's prophecies have different, there's four of them, each one is a little different. For the future, Reish is Goyim Amalek, the beginning of Goyim is Amalek. Bacharis, at the end, they have to be completely erased. So there's a lot of Hasidis on Reish is Goyim Amalek. There's a lot of my modem, a lot of my modem. Jews have been through a lot of tzaras. The Rebbe Rashab, two weeks before he passed away, and that famous, famous Purim, the, really the last public meeting with his Hasidim, he was 100% healthy. Then he got very quickly sick and quickly passed away. So he spoke about the severest evil, and he calls Mamol, gracious guy, Mamol, and what the Rebbe Rashab proposes in that moment, and in so many other Maimorim of a similar spirit, is that Hashem created good and evil. Hashem created good and evil. And in the words of the apostle, God Almighty created this opposite this, this one opposite this one. In other words, everything you have in Kedush, you have in Klib. Torah teaches us, Yiddishkeit teaches us that Kedusha wins, right? We call that Mashiach. What's Mashiach? Mashiach means Kedusha wins. That's the short of it. That's what Mashiach means. Mashiach means that Kedusha wins. That's what Mashiach means, that Kedusha wins. But until Mashiach comes, there's a war, there's a struggle. Of Zeli Yumazeh, one opposite the other. Kedusha has its strength, Klip has its strength, and they lock horns and they wrestle and they fight. So Hasidah says that there's all different types of Klipa, just like there's all different aspects in Kedusha. And every Klipa has a personality, every Klipa has a Mida, every Klipa has a definition. For example, some clippers are intelligent, some clippers are emotional, some clippers are very precise, some clippers are very kind, some clippers are very compassionate, some clippers are very judging, some clippers are very compromising, all different types of clippers. The nukuda of a clipper, the definition of a clipper in essence is that it's one meter. It doesn't have a full pro prospect. It can't be everything, it can only be one thing. Okay, now I said Kalipa, you have Kedusha. So for example, if there is a clip in the world that represents ideas, intellect, that clip is not going to have a problem with us learning Torah. But they're going to have a problem with us being emotional 
because it's not a part of their paradigm. They're going to have a problem with us having faith because it's not part of their paradigm. So every klipa is going to have aspects of Kedusha it's going to agree with and aspects of Kedusha it's going to have an issue with. You understand? But klipas have a definition. Klipas stand for something. And the thing that they stand for is, not, is actually not bad. It's good. It's just because it's only one pole, it becomes extreme. For example, you know, we live in a society that's very liberal and very, very kind. Those are good things. But when liberalism and kindness don't have any rules and any laws, then there's no lines, no end. It becomes so permissive that it becomes destructive. It's unsustainable. Or to say it in different words, when you're kind to the evil people, you end up being cruel to the truly kind and righteous people. That's what happens when you have a, a clipper with an, an extreme. But Hasidus will tell you, since every clip has a definition and every clipa has a positive aspect, you don't destroy a clipper. You're a Mavada clipper. You take the good out of every culture, take the good out of every civilization, take the good out of every society, and you incorporate it in Tavad Hashem. There are so many different clipas, there are so many different midas. Each one of them is a combination of a, a, a good kernel, a good point, and a, a klipa, which has to be removed. You extract the good and you dispose of the evil. You follow so far, yeah? What about a klipa that its whole entity is, I hate you? The expression is chutzpah belitag. You exist, I want to destroy you. And I don't even have a reason. I just can't stand that you are. What are you going to redeem? That's Amalek. That's Amalek. Amalek is a group of people, I call them the hyenas. They love chaos. They cannot stand order. Amalek doesn't fight to win. Amalek fights to create disorder. Amalek is evil without a redeeming quality. Amalek is evil without an excuse. Amalek doesn't have a philosophy that justifies its evil. The philosophy of the evil of Amalek is I hate Kedusha. That's it. So the Pesach tells you something very disturbing. Reish is Goyim Amalek. Every Klippa, every Goy. If you look at its head, you'll see Amalek. In other words, really all Klippas are rooted in Chutzpah. But most Klippas don't present that. Most Klippas are not so shameless as to say, I hate Kedusha just because Kedusha is Kedusha. Instead, they say, I don't like Taylor Mitzvahs because it's too strict to this group of people or too kind to that group of people or wrong in this case. So whatever the particulars are, they're cruel to animals or they're not so cruel to animals, whatever the particulars are, it doesn't matter what. Except for Amalek. Amalek does not put on a pretty face. Amalek does not try and present a logic or a philosophy to justify its chutzpah because it's out and out chutzpah. That's why it has to be destroyed. The philosophy, the theology that explains what separates Amalek from other nations is Amalek's hatred for Kedusha is simply because it's Kedusha. Not because it doesn't agree. Not because it's a different opinion. He cannot tolerate that Kedusha exists. You know, it's a little bit similar to the story of, of Hanukkah. The Syrian Greeks didn't mind Yiddish guy. They thought it was a beautiful culture. They minded, they bothered them that we believe. Faith. Their issue was that they didn't like the fact that we believed that there was a holiness to our lives. And it wasn't just culture. This wasn't a lifestyle. It's a very, very sinister evil. You understand? Um, and that's what Amalek is. This is why there is a, a mortal war, a mortal division between everything that's holy and Amalek. And the Torah says it's forever. You're supposed to remember Amalek. Amalek is long gone. Remember them. Remember a nation that's been assimilated into the rest of the world and lost. Nobody can identify Amalek anymore. The Torah says, remember, Zohar. You should erase. I will erase. What is it about Amalek that's so severe, that's so bad? It doesn't need a mitzvah forever and ever to remember these people, even once these people are, are technically are, are uh, as a race, as a nation, as a community, gone from the face of this earth because they represent the essence of anti-God. 
It's almost as if you were to say it's the Yechida of Klippa. You know, you ever heard about Yechida, yeah? Yechida means what? A relationship that I have with Hashem based on the fact that I'm one with Him. A Yid is a Yechida. I have a connection to Hashem on a level which can never be destroyed because me and David are one. The Yechid of Klippa is Amalek. I hate God. I don't even know why. I just can't stand Him. I hate the nation of God. I don't even know why. I just can't stand Him. That's what Amalek is. So this little story, it's ten, nine psukim, it's one of the shortest passages in the Tata. Nine psukim, the story of Amalek attacking the Jewish people becomes very, very important to our history and to our philosophy. Every evil can be redeemed, except when the evil is Amalek. And the meaning of Amalek is that my whole reality is I cannot stand that Kedusha exists. Not I disagree with Kedusha in this aspect. I can read... I'm, I'm, I'm writing a series of articles now. So I was reading them as I wrote last night. I was very proud of myself. It actually was written in Gans Kishmak. I'm going to have an editor. That's why it sounded so good. But if you study human history, history of the world, the Jews have been around for a long time. And we've lived in all kinds of parts of the world. Every civilization looked at the Jewish people as foreigners. Every civilization loved certain things about the Jewish people believed and hated certain others. But which ones they loved and which ones they hated changed over time. Because every civilization has another leaning, another bent. So a civilization which was very conservative and very exact, likes the Shulchan Aruch, likes the laws of Tznius, doesn't mind the fact that we eat meat, for example. But they have a big issue with forgiveness, with kindness, with looking after the underprivileged. They don't like that, yeah? And a civilization which is more kind and liberal has a problem with our laws of morality, has a problem with being so-called cruel to animals, eating meat, yeah? But, uh, but they love the fact that in Judaism, someone is sick, you heal him. Someone dies, you bury him. So what's the point? The point is, if you, if you take all civilizations that always existed, that ever existed, and all of Tata, there was always a civilization like one part of Tata. Together, they all like the whole thing. Why? Because Tate is a complete philosophy of life. Every nation is one slice of that. Amalek isn't a slice. <laughs> Amalek is chutzpah. Amalek doesn't have a flavor. It doesn't have a tendency. It doesn't have a thing that's good that it likes. It likes disorder. It likes the opposite of faith, the opposite of goodness, the opposite of righteousness. And when he identifies a nation, a group of people that represent goodness, he has to destroy them. He's destroying himself in the process. He's got to take the wind out of their sails. He has to take away the mystique. He has to ruin the, the, the respect that the Abish gave the Jewish people by doing all the miracles when they took them out of the land of Egypt. That's why this story is so important. Amalek is a group of people. And as I told you last week, I'm remembering now, there are cousins. Amalek is a grandson of Eliphaz. Eliphaz was ace of son, and he was actually a good guy. Hey, Eliphaz was one of the good guys. You know that there's a day, I think it's even in Chazal, but certain says in Sfarim, there's a book called Eiv, Job. Are you familiar with the Sefer Eiv? Yeah, it's a very interesting Sefer, or most interesting Sefer. And of course, part of what's interesting about the Sefer is that no one knows for sure whether the book ever actually happened, and if it did, when. And the Gemara, there's five or six different opinions, including the opinion that the entire book is an allegory. I, my opinion is that the book of Job happened many times. That there were many Jobs, many people who were righteous like Eve was, who suffered like Eve suffered. You know, that's what the book is about. Good, bad things happening to good people. And he's consoled by his friends. One of those friends is Aliphaz. That there's an opinion in the Gemara that the friend Eliphaz who comes to consult Job is Ace of Son. Eliphaz was a good guy. He grew up in Yitzchak's house. Ace of sends Eliphaz to kill Yankov Avinu, and he doesn't kill him. He just takes his wealth. <laughs> he just takes his wealth. He left him penniless. He didn't leave him 10 cents. He gave him a stick. Walk across the yard in. But Aliphas was not necessarily a, a holy guy, a pure guy. And he produced Mamzerim. Some of his children were illegitimate in the worst way. Amalek is one of his grandchildren. Amalek was a, a Mamzer. And it says in Chazal that Mamzerim, the Gemara says this, Mamzerim, children were born illegitimately, not kosher, have a lot of chutzpah. 
Amalek is the consummate chutzpanyak. He represents the idea of chutzpanyak. Amalek represents the entire concept of disrespect, of disorder. It's rooted in his pashat, in his genes. He, he wasn't a kosher person. He, wasn't, he was born, in, and then he was born out of wedlock. He was mamish amamzer. Um, and he carries this meat of chutzpah. And Amalek's nation is developing in, you know, in the south of Eretz Yisrael, as the Jewish nation is suffering in Mitzrayim. The Jewish nation come out of Mitzrayim, and the Jewish nation are the carriers of the bracha that Hashem had given Yitzchak and Abraham. Remember, Esav is Abraham, Yankov's brother. And the blessings, they were fighting over them, right? Yankov purchased from Esau the birthright and all of the rest. So Amalek becomes the anti-Yid. The Jewish person represents the nation of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the eternal nation, the nation that's supposed to represent what's true and what's righteous. And at the base of it is faith, and the base of it is miracles, and the base of, the base of it is something which is beyond human understanding. And Moloch's entire reality is the exact opposite of that. So the Chumash tells the story weeks after they left Egypt, weeks. Between the time the Jews left Egypt and got to Tate is seven weeks. In that small window, Amalek attacks us. And we never forgive him. We never forgive him. Or to say it more precisely, we never forgive it. And it becomes a commandment. There's some things you can't rehabilitate. That's the message. You want to fix, you want to rehabilitate everybody? Some things you cannot fix. Amalek represents an evil that the only way to fix him is to destroy him. Most things have redemptive qualities. There's something you could fix. There's something that you could redeem. There's something that you could transform. There's something that you could uplift. A mullah has to be destroyed. That's the story. That's basically that story. That's basically the story. So, as I always do, we learn sikhs on the Chumash. And there are two sikhs, or more than two sikhs. I'm still working on that, on a mullah that we're going to learn. But the sikhs deal with the details of the story. They don't deal with the story as a whole. So when I can't find the sikh, I use a maimir. So this is a maimir. We started this last week, and I'm really, really, I'm, I'm really rereading last week because I, I, I'm sorry, I was not well. What can I tell you? I was. Shh. So we're going to relearn what we learned last week. We're going to go faster. We're not going to. I'm, I'm going to read it, and I'm going to translate. We're going to move on, and you'll see how the Rebbe presents us with his theological understanding of what they represent. What does a mullah represent? Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? So, are you ready? Does everybody have one of these? Yeah, we're starting at the bottom of page 102. I'm starting exactly the same place I started last time from Vihine Klipa Samolik. Okay, Vihine Klipa Samolik. You should know that there's a klipa, there's a peel, there's a shell, there's a concealment that's called amalek. And you should know that in Hebrew, ayin, mem, lamid, kuf. If you know anything about gematria, it's 240. Ayin is 70, and mem is 40, is 110, and lamid is 30, is 140, and kuf is 100, is 240. 240 spells mar. You know what mar means? Bitter. Bitter. If you turn it around, it spells rom. Rom is translated in English as exalted, uplifted, which is a positive thing. The, the concept of Amalek is, is the bitterness is rooted in his arrogance. He comes into your life and he tells you he's better than you for no reason. <laughs> he's not smarter than you, he's not kinder than you, he's not more talented than you, he's not more accomplished than you, he's just better than you. So the Rom and the Mar go together. The, the, the character of Amalek, of condescending, and condescending for no reason. Again, the expression in Kabbalah is kisra bali taga, a chutzpah bali taga, a chutzpah with no crown. He has no leg to stand on. So the Rom, the exaltedness, is a crown. Amalek wears a crown of condescension. I'm higher than you. It's based on nothing, absolutely nothing. In addition, and this is very important, Amolek is the gematria suffix. Suffix. Samach pei kuf. Samach is 60, pei is 80, is 140. Kuf is 100. So suffix means uncertainty. Amol, all Amolek needs to do is to enter a little doubt. He doesn't have to destroy you. He has to take your life away. That's his business. Amolek cannot stand Kedusha. 
period. And that's the story of the, that's the biblical account of a Moloch attacking the Jewish people in that small window of time between the Jewish people left Egypt and they arrived at Harsin. Let's read the moment inside, okay? Klipas HaMolech and Yonah, the Klipa HaMolech's idea is lekare es Adam, to cool a person off. The Postal says, Asher Karcha Baderech. Now, girls, in Hebrew, the word Karcha is from the word Mikre. Mikre means coincidence. That's the meaning of the word. Okay, speak to anybody who knows modern Hebrew. You know, Bimikre, I bumped into you on a street corner, happened Bimikre, coincidentally. So, in the tradition of Hasidim, there is a discussion that says this. There are two Hebrew words that both mean coincidence. There are two Hebrew words that both mean coincidence. The first is the word mikre, the one I just mentioned. And the other is the word hisdamnus. Hisdamnus. Hisdamnut. If anybody, anybody in this room has any familiarity with Hebrew, you know that word as well. Hisdamnut also means a coincidence. But there's a very, very big difference between the spirit of the word mikre, which means a coincidence, and the spirit of the word hisdamnut, which also means a coincidence. The difference is mikre is chance by accident. Hisdamnut means a fortuitous coincidence as if someone actually organized it. Hisdamnus means as if someone was mizamen, someone made it happen. So mikre means coincidence and hisdamnus means coincidence. But mikre means coincidence that seems to have happened by mistake. Hisdamnus means a coincidence seems to have happened on purpose. In other words, Mikra connotes coincidence because the world is out of control. His damnus means coincidence because we believe in Ashkoch Pratis. You follow? So the words are the same translation, but their spirit, their undertone is different. From one extreme to the next. In the word Mikra, you emphasize the chanceness of it, the random of it. And in the word his damnus, you emphasize the fact that there really isn't any chance. Okay? Now let me talk you through this. The Ramam talks about this in Hukas Tainis, that there's a section of the Torah called the Toichacha. You know what that means? There's a section of the Torah where Hashem is threatening the Jewish people that if they're not going to keep Torah Mitzvah, he's going to punish them severely. Are you familiar with that? Twice in the Chumash, you have Toichacha. Hashem is telling the Jewish people if they're not going to be Jews, there's going to be all kinds of terrible calamity that are going to befall them. One of them is in Pashas Bechukaisai, which is the end of Sefer Vayikra, and the other is in Pashas Kisavi, which is near the end of Sefer Dvarim. Are you familiar with this? Ah, uh, you know about this, yes? Yeah, In the first version, in the, in the Leviticus, in Pashas Bechukaisai, over and over and over again, you have the word Keri, Kufresh Yud. Halachtam Ami Bekeri, Afani Eilichim Ochem Bekeri, Kufresh Yud. So the Chazal say that Amma makes a big deal out of this. Keri means you're going to act like nothing matters. Everything is an accident. If a Jew knows that Hashem provides and Hashem guards and Hashem looks after and Hashem preserves and so forth and so on, you behave in a way that's consistent with the fact that this world has a balabayist, right? The, the first person to say let's din, let's die was Kayan. There's no judges, there's no judgment. That's Keri. The world is half I can do what I want. Right? What did the Romans say? Eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. That's all based on a philosophy of nihilism. There's nothing. There's nothing. So a Jew's relationship to Hashem, a Jew's life is not out of reflect Keri. A Jew's life is supposed to reflect his damnus, order. There is a God who created the world and he governs in Bajgacha Pratis. We don't understand everything that he does in how he governs his world, but there is a planet, there's a direction, and there's a purpose, and there is usefulness. So when the Torah speaks about the Jewish people rebelling, it uses the term keri. When you act in a way that you are demonstrating that you don't believe in order, that you don't believe in Bajgacha Pratis, you believe in chance. So the Ebishta says, Halach the Mimi Bakeri. You act as if there's no balabas. I'll show you how it feels. I'm going to hide from you. And when Hashem hides from us, it seems like there's no hashgacha. And when it seems like there's no hashgacha, the world seems to reflect disorder. And again, in the words of Kayin, less din will as die, there's no judgment, there's no judgment. So Hashem is punishing us in kind. When we behave like as if 
nobody's in charge of our world. Hashem allows us to feel like nobody's looking after us. That's how that entire Teich goes, the entire sequence of Psukim in Pashas Buchu Koysai followed this model. Keri and Keri, Hamas Keri. It's a, it's a whole series of developmental stages, but that's the point. So Amalek, so wait, let's go back. We have two Hebrew words that both mean coincidence, but one means coincidence, which is fortuitous, which is someone did this, and the other means coincidence, which is totally random. Amalek represents the latter. And when the Eibishter does not happen with the Jewish people, then Jewish people turn their back on the Eibishter. It's called Keri. You follow? I once saw an article, a woman, here in Mechon Chana, Mechon Yadis, many years ago, gave me an article in the Reader's Digest. I could be, I even saved it someplace in a folder. Which is a remarkable thing. They did a study on coincidence. What does coincidence mean? Fortuitous chance events. That's what cards means. Something good happens that shouldn't have happened because nobody planned it. Now, there are laws of probability, right? There's mathematical laws of probability. If there are so many people living in New York and there are so many street corners in New York and there are so many days in a person's life, the chances of Reuven and Rachel meeting at a particular street corner at a particular time can be mathematically calculated. You can mathematically figure out what are the odds of these two people meeting. And it's in one of the billions or the trillion. It's, the numbers are staggering, right? If, if everything is, if I'm not looking for you and you're not looking for me and we bump into each other, what is the mathematical likelihood of that happening? Now, the laws of probability says that over time, they'll balance out. In other words, you may bump into a friend three times in a week and then not see a friend for the next 20 years. But over time, the percentage of fortuitous meetings should be consistent with the law of probability. If I'm not looking for you and I bump into you, it shouldn't happen more frequently than once in some great number. You understand? And the fact is that coincidence exceeds the laws of probabilities by thousands of percent. The number of fortuitous chance meetings is in complete violation of the laws of statistics, of the laws of probability. Why? Because there is a God, that's why. Because is Ashkoch Pratis. If 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 in fact, again using Kayan's quote, less din, less dying, there's no judgment, there's no judgment, there's no Ashkoch Pratis. That's not saying there isn't a God. It's saying that this God is not running his world. The chances of you meeting an old friend should be as unlikely as mathematics in its cold, heartless form should present. And the fact is that the, the number of people who bump into other friends or good events that happen by mistake exceeds the mathematical likelihoods by thousands of percent. It happens thousands of times more than it should happen. In other words, this is a mathematical proof for Gacha Pratis. Mathematical proof that this world does not make it, it's his damnus. It's not Keri, it's his damnus. You understand? A Moloch represents Asher Karcha. A Moloch's entire MO. It's all an accident. It's all by mistake. And he wants to impress that on you. One more, one more detail. One more detail. And I don't know why I'm doing this, because I don't need to do this, and it's, it's going to be a little bit unfamiliar to you. But I'm going to do it anyway, okay? You're all comfortable with me saying that there are two Hebrew words that mean coincidence. Mikre and his damas, right? Yes? How do you spell Mikre? Mem, Kuf, Reish, Hey. This is how you spell it. Mem, Kuf, Reish, Hey. This is Mikre. What happens if I spell it mem kuf reish aleph? What does that mean? To call. Vayikra. Mikro and mikre are opposites. Mikra with a he connotes an accident. Mikro with an aleph is somebody beckoning, someone calling. You understand? 
Mikra with a hey means a coincidence. Mikra, the Torah the, the, the Chumish, is called Mikra with an Aleph. Why? Because the entire Torah in the Lashon of Chazal is Shmoyzim Shakad Baruch. The entire Tanakh is names of God. So the, the Tanakh is us calling Hashem. So Mikra with a hey and Mikra with an Aleph, I'm going to raise this a little bit so I can see, it are philosophical opposites. Do you understand? I'm not, I'm not going with the literal translations of the word. I'm going with the spirit of the word. The spirit of the word mikra means something that happens has no meaning. The spirit of the word mikra with an aleph is a, something that happens that has much meaning because somebody made it happen. Someone called it out. Someone is responsible for why it's occurring. Do you follow? You follow? Here's an interesting thing. There's a mitzvah in the Chumash which is called Shilua Hakan. Are you familiar with Shilua Hakan? You know what it means. Shilua Hakan means you have to send away a mother bird if you want to take the eggs or the chicks, right? How does that parsha begin? It's two psukim in the Chumash, and there's so much Kabbalah on Shilua Hakan, you have no idea. What's the big deal? You go, you're going on the road, you come across a nest, you send away the mother, even a hundred times, Allah says, and you take the eggs, or you take the unfledged birds. You know how much Kabbalah there is in that? You have no idea. You have no idea. It's a whole Kabbalah. The mother is Bina and the chicks are Zan. It's a whole story. There's a lot of Kabbalah on what seems like a totally obscure mitzvah. Here's what's interesting. The Pasha of Yiluah HaKan begins with these words, Ki kare. If it will happen, how would you spell ki yikare? Yud, kuf, reish. Come on. Ki yikare. Ki yikare kantipa lefanecha. You encounter coincidentally a nest of birds. Ki yikare. How would you spell the word yikare? Yud, kuf, reish. Hey, why? Because it's happening by mistake. You know what the Gemara says in Ki Yikare? Now, what does Mizumonim sound like? His damnus. If you have nests of birds that you are farming, right? People farm birds as they farm chickens and goats. Uh, goats and, and sheep and cows, yeah? If you have birds in a farm, you don't have to send away the mother bird. It's only ki kare if it happens on the road. Baderech, on the road. It's not even in your house. And you know what's crazy? If you open up a chumash, say for dvorim, pashat ki seitzei, ki kare is spelled with an aleph. It shouldn't be. It should be spelled with a hey. It's spelled with an aleph. I got the book right in front of me. Why? Because coincidences are not coincidences. The Torah is teaching us a lesson that even when the Torah talks about coincidence and it gives you a mitzvah, you should know a coincidence is called by God. Kufresh Aleph means someone is calling it. In other words, the truth is that the Mikre is a Hizdamnus. What looks like a coincidence, looks like a random event, is organized by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And I, I, this is a Remes, which is explicit in the Torah, that you use the word Mikre, coincidence, but you spell it with an Aleph, to indicate that even an accident is not really an accident. You follow? The enemy of all of this is Amalek. Amolog is a sher korcha. Amolog wants to come along and take even the greatest miracle, even the most overt and explicit event of Ashkacha Pratis and say, eh, it happened. You understand? Go back to your text. I'm on the bottom of page 102. The second, the last paragraph, the end of the first line, the meaning of the word karcha means he comes across you by mistake. Now, Amalek didn't come across us by mistake. They went looking for us. But they're trying to assert the phenomena of mistake. You were in Egypt, mistake. 
10 plagues, mistake. The death of the first bird, no big deal. You went out of Mitzrayim, no big deal. Eh, it's all nothing. You know why it's all nothing? Because it'll be gone tomorrow. Nothing is going to last. It's not real. Now it's 3,000 years later. We're sitting here telling that story. Amalek is not here to defend its position. Like I said, even though it's a mitzvah to erase Amalek forever, but again, if you go with the halacha, Bo Sancherev, or Bilbala Sa'ilam, there's no more identifiable Amalek. That's the halacha. The mitzvah erasing Amalek exists, but the Amalek that you need to erase is gone. But their argument was, you'll be gone tomorrow. I remember when I was a child, it happened in the 1970s. This actually happened to me. My father used to subscribe to the Time Magazine, and then the Time Magazine started putting in inappropriate pictures. So we canceled that subscription and he ordered U.S. News and World Report. But I remember when we still subscribed to the magazine, they had a page called People. And somebody had climbed up on the Tower of Titus, probably 1977, before my Bar and sprayed on the words, Am Yisrael Chai. I remember seeing the picture. You know what the, you know what the Tower of Titus is? It's, it's the Arch of Titus. Titus came back from Jerusalem after plundering Jerusalem and he built a monument to himself. The history of ancient Rome is that they would do, they would fight wars, they would make conquest, they would get whatever they called spoil, tribute, and they would use the money to build themselves monuments. <clears throat> and what's interesting about it is those monuments exist. In other words, in a way, the Romans immortalize themselves. You know, the Colosseum is still standing. The Arch of Titus, there's many, many monuments in the ancient Roman world that are representing wars and victories of peoples that are now gone. So somebody, so, so the Jews who were slaves were marched under that arch. And the Roman legionnaires with their red costumes stood on either side and made the Jews walk. Like the picture depicts, they're carrying the menorah and they're carrying the caleb and so on. If you would go over to a Roman legionnaire 2,000 years ago and say, listen, you see these slaves? One of these slaves is going to come along someday and write on this arch, Am Yisrael, Chai, the Jewish people live, and not one of you is going to be here to stop him. Not one of you. What would he tell you? No way. They're done. They're history. They're the past. They're gone. We're the future. And it happened. <laughs> I, they cleaned it up. I, you know, I was never in Rome. I've never seen the Arch. But it's very big. The Arch of Titus is like here, like the Grand I mean, It's massive. I don't know, it's 100 feet tall. It's not 20 feet high. It's gigantic. Somebody climbed up to the very top of the arch and sprayed on graffiti. Am Yisrael Chai. So Amolek is saying nothing is Chai. Nothing is forever. It's all nonsense. It's all come and go. Eat, drink, and be married. Tomorrow we're gone. You exist today. You're not going to exist tomorrow. That's the whole history of the world. But the Jewish people are the antithesis of that because we're connected to the, to the Abishter. And really, our mission and our mandate is not that we should survive. It's that we should teach the world that there's something which is forever which is the Abishter and the Torah and for Lahabal Goyim, the Sheva Mitzvah, Spenei Noyach. Right? This is our mandate. This is what we are. Amalek is the enemy of that for no reason. <coughs> if he were the enemy of that for a reason, we'd fix him. But he's the enemy of the Asher Korcha. His whole reality is it's all mistakes. It's all coincidence. Okay, you, you, you're doing good. <laughs> you feel secure and strong. Well, guess what? You're not the first. You're not going to be the last. Don't worry. One day you'll be gone. As an identifiable nation of Jewish people, you will be erased from the face of this earth. Not because anybody's going to kill you. That's just the nature of things. It is evolution. It's all mistakes, all accidents. And the Jewish people were just told by Hashem himself through Moshe Rabbeinu that they're no, no, they're, they're eternal. Why are they eternal? Because Hashem is eternal and the Torah is eternal. And ultimately the whole world needs to be in line, in sync with this eternity. Let's read. May I? Yeah. His whole role is to shed doubt, uncertainty, to throw in the philosophy of random on the road of being a Jew. Hashem, a yid, is on the road of God Almighty. 
And there's a whole Hasidus on Derech Havaya. There's a whole bunch of Hasidus that says, means the road of Hashem. It means a path. It means order. It means normalcy. It doesn't mean infinity. A person is at the, at, the, at the initial stages of going out of Mitzrayim. As the Pasuk says, as we depart from Egypt, as we cross the border from Egypt into the world. What's Mitzrayim? Mitzrayim, as you know, the root of the word Mitzrayim is Mitzah, narrowness, constraint, right? That means no free will. What's no free will mean? Anybody? No personal responsibility, right? Slaves don't have to worry about themselves. <laughs> they may not be that, their lives may not be that important, but they don't have to worry about their life. Somebody else is worrying about them. Right? No personal responsibility and no prospect of ever becoming anything different than they are. That's what a slave is. Freedom means I'm responsible for me. I have to take care of me, but I can make me into a bigger me. Not a bigger me, I have more money. A big me have more power. A bigger me, I have more righteousness. I have more goodness. My life is more a reflection of the image of God today than it was yesterday. In Mitzrayim, that possibility did not exist. We just exited from Mitzrayim. We're beginning to become a nation. We're beginning to become a people that are called the people of God who need to figure out how to be free and embrace the responsibility, embrace the challenge. You can do whatever you want. Do the right thing. Isn't that a great slogan? It really is. You can do whatever you want. Do the righteous thing. Not the lazy thing. Not the expedient thing. Not the short-sighted thing. Not the superficial thing. The right thing. You have to be free. If you're not free, there's no way you can do the right thing. Now, if you're free, there's the risk of you doing the wrong thing. There's always that risk. But as a free person, there's also the promise of doing the right thing. And who do you bump into, Amalek? What does he tell you? Right, there's no such thing. You see, you understand the drama, yeah? You just became free. You just became free. You're now in a position to choose a path of life for yourself. And there are many paths that are very, very empty and very meaningless, and very superficial and very temporary. And then there's the path of righteousness. Being free in gives you the possibility to choose the path of righteousness. And Amalek tells you there's no such path. It's all a bunch of short-sightedness. It's all about eat and drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. There is no path of righteousness. That's his whole geshef, at this whole business. Just turn the page. We just begin to do our work. Top of page 103. Yeah, please look inside. Yes, Lot says, "May Hamid Sodim va'Gavulim Shaloi to depart from our narrowness and the limitations." Bo Oz, Bo Amolek lekarade. Along comes Amolek. He doesn't have to defeat you. He doesn't have to prove you're wrong. He has to just cool you off. Really, you're going to use your freedom to be a righteous person. Use your freedom to have fun. Use your freedom to entertain yourself. Why? Because there is no righteousness. That's Amalek's entire MO. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. Let's pause. Let's stop. Yeah, it's 20 to 12. I've been talking for over an hour, well over an hour. Let's see if we can reconvene in five minutes. I say that every single week and it never happened. And we'll continue to read. I'm just breaking because I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, okay. Now, I think you will agree